So to start with is probably best to start with the actual definitions of stockouts versus shortages, which WHO, after the issue was raised at the World Health Assembly, did come out with a definition. So you have shortage, which is the in-country, as opposed to shortage, which is mostly caused by external factors. These two things, I mean, you can read the definition. These two things get very muddied, as I'll, I'll give you some examples in terms of where external factors outside of the control of government result in stockouts, but not as much as shortages. So the World, Healthy, uh, World Health Assembly uh, resolution two years ago, they committed a, a couple of things. One, that they would monitor and report on stockouts. Two, that they would engage and call upon industry to be a part of the solution in addressing the problems. And three, help to define, uh, further define def definitions. They also made an important call, and we'll talk about the implication of this, in order to ensure that monopolies that are related to patents don't unnecessarily infringe upon a country's ability to maintain a healthy supply of drugs. So the route of medicines, I added a box of API uh, suppliers, because that will come in, uh, it's very critical in terms of the penicillin shortage, the global shortage that was happening for a while. So the APIs goes to the generic, I'm sorry, the pharmaceutical manufacturer, then procurement management, and then however it gets into country, starting with the central medicine stores, down to the provincial regional medical stores, the district med or zonal medical stores where they exist, the health facility, and might even go beyond the lowest uh, health facility. So where we see a lot of problems, but not only, is on that last mile of delivery, where the commodities meet the, or not the end user. So I'd like to talk about the case study of penicillin. Now, this is all information that was um, brought together by WHO, PAHO, AFRO, and CHAI, with WHO and CHAI doing the heavy lifting. And I'm going to make the case that considering CHAI's work on this example, but also on ARVs, and boy, do I wish they were working on TB drugs as well, we would do well to have someone provide CHAI with funding or another actor so that they can um, help to foster the, the market and healthy market dynamics as they have for ARVs. So to point out um, the big problem, there was a global shortage for quite a number of years. Uh, here is the map in terms of countries that experience problems. Um, WHO and its partners in CHAI surveyed 114 countries, 95% responded, 39 of those countries did experience a shortage, only 10 out of the 39 had a substitution for the penicillin, and 56 countries did not experience a shortage. Now, part of the instability of supply was caused by the fact that one of the API, that's active pharmaceutical in, um, ingredient manufacturers, dropped out. So here, from the article from WHO and CHAI, you have in black all of the actors that were then affected, and the red lines in terms of how it affected everybody down the line. So I, also, the, in terms of quality, it's worth pointing out that the three API manufacturers that were left after the one API manufacturer dropped out. None of them were pre-qualified by WHO or approved by a single stringent drug regulatory authority. So there is an issue, and we're going to come to a couple of examples in terms of price, certainly, supply, and as well, quality. So the findings and recommendations um, the findings were, were pretty stark in terms of uh, where countries didn't have the drug, where they weren't able to have quality substitution. So, and they, they link the problems to, uh, to a number of factors. The largest was sole sourcing through the supply chain, where there was a single wholesaler, a single f uh, final dose formulator, and a single API manufacturer. Um, secondly, was uh, some of the authors point to the low price of medicine, which means you weren't able to attract some of the generic manufacturers and other API producers that you would normally want to have in order to have a diverse, diversified supply market. Also, um, some of the API manufacturers dropped out of producing this drug because they were uh, they were prioritizing um, let's uh, more more profitable medicines. So six API manufacturers dropped out, and more than 40 of the final drug producers also left the market since the early 2000s. Then there's lack of consolidation on the demand side. So if you have individual countries that are placing orders for drugs, 
and it do, it's not seem at, seen as profitable enough up the supply chain in order to go back to the API producer to c create that batch of medicines, then that's a problem. So consolidation on the demand side is something that um, we have done with pediatric ARVs, with TB drugs, with HIV diagnostics, with TB diagnostics, and it helps. It helps to bridge these markets. And also to bridge the markets, not only across countries, but also across disease. So you wouldn't believe it, but it took a, a number of years, finally, for countries to get together, and even the Global Fund, to negotiate both for HIV gene expert cartridges for viral load, as well as for TB gene expert cartridges. So it seems like it would be, of course, uh, logical, but it wasn't at the time. So consolidation on the demand side, that means pooling of uh, purchasing power. And then, of course, what is happening in country. And there are a lot of problems, and uh, there, they're, um, I'm sure, known to everyone in the room in terms of poor forecasting in country as well as poor procurement practices. So if there is not a reliable information system in terms of looking at usage and not just relying on old orders, then there will be shortages, as there was with penicillin and some of the other drugs. So another case study I'd like to talk through a bit of the example in South Africa, and this is not related to, to one drug necessarily, but it's where civil society got involved. We had a number of actors, and there they are at the bottom, including MSF, work together to monitor, live monitoring, using um, people who would call in, report in, text in where there were shortages in the facilities that they visited. Now, unfortunately, they're not tracking any antibiotics that are used to treat STIs, but they do have a number of other drugs that they're reporting. This is a snapshot of what was on their website today. So this is today's picture based on what people have called in, uh, submitted in terms of stockouts. So you see that there are some flashing lights here. So what, uh, in addition to the the sort of live capturing of information, uh, the crowdsourcing. There was also a survey that was, um, that was done every couple of years by this coalition. Now, they reached out to facilities, and I'll tell you what those, how many facilities in a moment, but what they found, um, they asked uh, at the point of contact, have there been shortages, stockouts, sorry, in the previous three months? So one in four facilities did report a stockout, one in five facilities reported a stockout of adult ARVs, and 70% of facilities reported stockouts lasting more than one month. Now I should say that the drugs that they're looking at, the med medical commodities, are TB uh, drugs, HIV drugs, and vaccines. So in terms of ARV and, and TB medicines, what they found was that nearly one in five stockouts uh, occurred in the last, within the last the three months of contact with the facility having no medication whatsoever. 70% of those facilities had a stockout for longer than one month. Now I'd like to talk about uh, the brand name Kalitra. The generic name is Lopinavir Ritonavir. This is an important protease inhibitor that is used to treat people second line uh, treatment of HIV for adults, first line treatment of children. Uh, in South Africa, the drug is patented for the adult formulation. What happened was AbbVie wasn't able to supply the drug, but they also refused to let a generic manufacturer supply the drug. They could have issued a voluntary license, they refused. What, got, what uh, civil society did, what MSF did then, is for us to break the patent, to, call, to issue a compulsory license so that the South African government would be able to import a generic version of the drug. Now, mind you, people were leaving facilities without the drug. Many of them were, were uh, switched to another regimen, but many also were not. So finally, after pressure and after months and months, uh, Abvi agreed to expand the voluntary license that they had given for some of their formulations to the adult formulations and the, the drugs that were needed in South Africa. So as a result, some of the generic manufacturers were able to provide pricing and government was able to procure using competition because then Abvi dropped their price. Now, I just want to say that um, at the time, and this was quite a time, that uh, lipinavir ritonavir containing formulations accounted for 30% of all of the HIV or TB drug stockouts in the country. So while this was a problem where you had, again, AbbVie manufacturing capacity was not able to meet demand. 
but they also kept the stranglehold on government in terms of having a life-saving option for people in the country that were in need. Uh, you see at the bottom here, so a, a, a quarter of a facility turned away patients without a supply or with an incomplete res regimen. So I hope you can see that those, there were some that were switched to other drugs, um, some facilities that were able to borrow supplies from others, and that has, uh, has been a, a common practice in some areas. Now I'd like to talk about pediatric dilategravir. This is a very live issue. So here again, this is a situation where um, and especially it happens with, with pediatric formulations. Why? Because it's a small market. So uh, Vive, which is an offshoot of both Pfizer and GSK, they hold the patent for, pedi for Delategravir. But they decided to be very generous and provide a voluntary license for the pediatric Delategravir, not the adult version, to the medicine's patent pool. The problem is, is that no one else picked up the license and decided to manufacture. Why? Because it's not a lucrative market. So then you had countries trying to place orders without anyone responding to the tender. So Abvi, I'm sorry, Vive was not producing and agreeing to supply. And why did they not supply? They didn't supply because they refused to sell the drug in any country where their drug was not registered but they also were not registering their drug. So 18 months after approval from the European Medical Association, Vive has, t as of today, has only submitted registration dossiers in only three countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. Again, this is a very live issue, and we have talked to the CEO about the patients that we have, children who need this drug in Malawi and other countries where we work. And last week, we sent a sign-on letter to that CEO and demanded an answer for the question, will you use a waiver so that you can company can provide drug to country, even where in lieu of registration? Will you register as a matter of priority the drug? And we're supposed to have an answer by tomorrow. We'll see. Now, um, DRC. So this is probably the oldest study I'm going to show you, but it's still very much a live issue. It's just the fact that this is um, strong, quantified information. So MSF carried out a cross-sectional survey involving visits to facilities and warehouses in, across um, a couple of months in 2015. There were 28 high-burden facilities um, defined as over 200 people on ART, 64 low burden facilities defined as under 200 people on ART, overall serving 22,000 people who were enrolled on ART. Uh, MSF, we looked at three adult ARV regimens, uh, CTX tablets, and HIV rapid tests. So the biggest problems were not with the coke all, but with one regimen, that's the tenofovir, 3TC, and efavirenz. So stockouts were found in 56% of high burden and 43% of low burden facilities due to a national shortage. And that the median stockout was 36 days. So in 54% of overall ART stockout cases in these facilities, the patients did not receive any medicines whatsoever. Um, you can go to the article and, and look at this graph more completely because it shows the number of days and facilities. I'm just conscious of time. So how large is the problem? So in 2016, WHO uh, put out a report based on surveys of re and reporting they, they did in tw 2005 and 2014 that 36% of 1,700 ART clinics across 35 countries had at least one stockout. So the effects of HIV commodity stockouts, I'm sure, are are clear, or at least should be. Um, just uh, because of time, I'm going to rush through. Now, here is an emerging threat. So already you have weak health systems. You've got stringent intellectual property rights that are keeping generic uh, versions of drugs, and especially more affordable versions, out of country. But then there's a new threat. So essentially, 2002, Global Fund uh, launches. They pool demand. Now, let me try to put that in a human way. They purchase high volume of drugs for countries. Because they are purchasing high volumes of drugs and diagnostics, they're able to negotiate lower prices. So that's good. Lower prices, high volume, that's good. Secondly, they say that they will only procure for countries drugs that are either pre-qualified by the WHO or approved by a stringent drug regulatory authority. So. They have stringent quality standards. Third, they, in terms of the forecasting and the work they do on the supply side, 
they and other partners, if you've heard of Pado and Cado and all of these other consortia, they meet with generic manufacturers of the drug companies, along with WHO, and they look to the future and they say, these are where the recommendations are going. This is the sort of volume that we expect. This is our global forecasting. This is what we think the market will look like. And they're able to either attract more sources of drugs or at least be able to prepare the companies for high volumes. They also, the fourth role of the Global Fund and their partners, including the Global Drug Facility, has been to prepare countries in terms of helping them with their national forecasting. So then we're in a situation where 16 years of building up these healthy markets, again, quality, price, volume, in terms of supply. Now, the Global Fund is turning off the tap for some countries. One, because some of the middle-income countries that do not have the highest disease burden will no longer be eligible for Global Fund funding. So they are switching to national procurement systems and their own funding. Two, there are some countries, also because of um, smaller amount of funding and actually flatlining from donors, where the Global Fund is stipulating that for countries to be able to continue to use Global Fund funding, they have to put some of their own money on the table. Now, there's nothing that sounds so wrong about that. But then you have to look a bit at the math. And you also have to look a bit at the impact on procurement. Because the co-financing that is being recommended also has to do with commodities. So if I say to you, you're responsible for half of your ARVs, what does that mean then? What's going to happen for the pediatric market? You're going to negotiate your own price? You're going to use your own local suppliers? Are you going to use producers that are not pre-qualified? And then what does that mean for forecasting when, that's, when that support drops out? So we are concerned about all of these things. And I'm going to give you a, a few examples. So registration. Drugs that are procured for the Global Fund right now do not have to be registered in country. They get an import waiver. And this is great because a lot of companies don't register their products because it's expensive and they have to do country hopping, one by one by one. Each drug, each country, one by one by one. So for the last 16 years, we've all enjoyed this import waiver process. Switching to national procurement then, that goes away. Secondly, higher prices where companies and countries will negotiate one-on-one -on -one and you don't have high volume. So two examples. In Armenia, the the government was supposed to buy their own first-line TB drugs. And they did. They issued a national tender. However, nobody responded to the tender. Why? Because it's not a large enough market, so why should I respond? So there was a shortage of first-line TB drugs. MSF was asked to fill the gap. In India, India it was now, is now charged with buying their own ARVs. However, so they, they bid out, and it was a national um, production, a, uh, a national company that won the bid. However, it's not pre-qualified. It's not approved by a stringent drug regulatory authority. So we have that quality issue. But also, they weren't able to meet demand. So right now, there is a shortage of pediatric ARVs. So what needs to happen is the example I just gave you in terms of the, of the global fund. There is yet to be a meeting where you have all of the actors that are implicated in the same room to discuss the, what, what is going to happen with this co-financing and transition, where essentially countries will fall off the cliff and we lose these healthy markets. So there needs to be more communication across stakeholders in terms of these emerging threats. Also, in terms of the stakeholders, there could be a role for the antibiotics we know we need in order to have a su stable supply. In the same kin that was done for ARVs, pediatric ARVs, HIV diagnostics, TB diagnostics, which is, again, looking at the market fragility and trying to address that through direct communication with actors, including companies. We also need to improve monitoring and reporting all up and down the supply chain. And we need to equip and support civil society to be a part so that the examples you see in South Africa, where they have made quite the difference, the Stop Stockouts campaign, can be expanded and supported elsewhere. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.